has been fully restored electrically and cosmetically. In other words, it's been cleaned and chemically stabilized. Um, the capacitors were brought back to uh, full state but through a reforming process. The ceramic capacitors were brought above their curie point so that they are actually as new. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, this is one of the only boards that are functional that have all the original RAM on it. Uh, it is in near perfect condition. This is an actual 1976 bike shop case that came with it. Uh, this case came from the bike shop. The Apple one was just the board. And now we've actually got uh, the case that came with it. So you have a board, a case, a data netics keyboard, and so this is the whole package. You also see underneath is the manual as well. So this is a complete set as it came in 1976. The only modification to this is the fact that the owner actually used this system. So there was a power switch, indicator, and an LED added for the cassette adapter to be able to view the uh, calibration. Also, the video connector was moved over to a larger video connector so you could hook up a different kind of monitor. But of the actual bike shop cases, this is one of only uh, a handful that are available, less than five, and this is one of the, one of the few that are in great condition. Uh, there is only one other case I know of that has no modifications, though that board hasn't been seen or since it's been seen in years. We don't know if it's still in track or where it is. Uh, it's only, we don't know if that unit's functional. It's just photographs that were on the page. So I'm going to assemble this now, put it all together, and we'll have a demonstration of the original Apple One. We will load BASIC, which is one of the ways you know that it's a fully functional system. Apple did include a checkout program in the guide. The checkout program is interestingly enough, you could have bad RAM chips and it still works because just odds on, the commands that are used only use a couple of uh, like six of the bits. They don't use all of the bits, so you could have a couple of bad RAM chips. If you lucked out, you were good. So uh, running basic is the only way to actually prove it works. Uh, also running basic means you have a full 8K system. They came with 4K, so you get 8K. Basic is loaded off of cassette. We use an iPod today or an iPhone. It loads completely into RAM. <coughs> Builds up a whole bank of memory and then uh, it uses parts of the lower memory to hold full of variable information. So basically, uh, your system has to be fully operated. Yeah. The NCI boards were the second run of boards. They are rarer, they were less actually distributed. Built by someone in our uh, computer federation here. So it's much clearer monitor, makes it easier for you guys to see. Um, so it's very easy. When you power on an Apple One, you get kind of the startup screen. So we'll clear the screen, and then we reset the processor. Now, because of that keyboard extender, I have to sometimes hit this twice, or a few times, because it actually has a little bit extra length. It's the only thing that's not extended on there. Now, I used to have a capacitor on it to help out with the noise, but you know, it wasn't worth bothering me. So. <coughs> So I'm going to use an iPhone to do this now. <laughs> You're just playing an audio file. Playing an audio file. Like... Yep. Now you can just do things like uh, memory and... Program memory in it's basic monitor. It's very similar to the original Apple II monitor without the assembly and all the other stuff. It fits in um, 256 bytes of memory and assembly. Now to load something. Now the interesting part is uh, I will load something. I am a terrible typist. You will notice this because there is no backspace. No <coughs> There's no backspace. The, uh, now, the Apple One is actually a terminal and a computer combined together. Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs had designed a terminal. Well, actually, Woz designed a terminal. Steve Jobs and Wozniak sold it before they had the company Apple to a third party. <coughs> they decided to, well, uh, Woz decided to take that terminal and hook up a microprocessor to it. So the terminal is actually optimized for 300 bars. 
So it's very slow, but the machine itself is actually faster than Apple II because it doesn't do many of the things the Apple II does in software, it does in hardware. So I'm going to go here and let's see if I can do this without typoing. I'll load basic. <laughs> and it's as reliable as cassette decks were back then, so uh, an iPod or an iPhone is actually marginal. It doesn't produce enough volume. Uh, and even to light up the cassette's uh, calibration LED. Regular cassette adapter would. But an iPod on, or an iPhone on Max works better than an old tape from the 1970s because it has a stretch. So you give a little and you, and, you, know, you deal with it. Could I have brought a cassette player with a real cassette and like, just a new copy? Probably. I would also have to deal with rewinding it. It's a little easier. Well, particularly, you can put a little battery operated amp. <coughs> you can do a preamp, yeah. Yeah, it makes it up a little bit. But it's not worth it. Most of the time, it works. Because it's digital, you can sort of get away with increasing the gain a little bit so when, you, when you create some recording. <laughs> So now we have basic loaded off cassette. It's loaded into 4K of memory. We have 8K on this machine. Uh, you must have 8K to run basic. Um, this is integer basic without all the fancy graphic and sound stuff of uh, the Apple II. Uh, it was completely hand assembled on yellow pad. Uh, Boss could not afford an assembler. So this is an original Apple One running basic. Fully functional. So the next thing we'll do is let's load uh, an actual program. So uh, I've been loading for everyone Star Trek. We'll do that. Maybe we'll load Hunt the Wampus or something else. So now, interesting. If I hit clear and I don't reset it, it's still drawing over. So you kind of want to reset and then hit clear. <laughs> so let's load 8K Apple Star Trek, which is was probably one of the more popular games uh, in the day for most personal computers. Was to run uh, was to run Star Trek. This was actually ported by Wendell Sander, Dr. Wendell Sander of Apple. Dr. Sander was a uh, was a chip designer. And he went, he had an Apple One, he showed Steve Jobs, hey, look at this, I ported Creative Computing's Star Trek onto an Apple One. And Steve Jobs convinced him to leave his cushy, uh, nice job at a chip manufacturer to go work for this startup Apple. He was employed, I think, 14 or 15. So we're gonna add, we're gonna go out and put in the address, and hopefully we get a nice load on this. So we have to get basic where it's variables and stages. And in about a minute, it should load. Now this um, cassette adapter is 1,200 baud. <clears throat> which was an incredible speed at the time, considering it also had very few chips on it. Most cassette adapters were gigantic with lots and lots and lots of analog uh, electronics on it. This was completely done digitally and in software where tricks were done to create analog uh, signals using digital chips. There was only one op amp on the entire uh, card. And it was very inexpensive to make. The case is gorgeous. It is just gorgeous. The last, the last
last case I worked on, they actually had chopped up the bottom so they could stick a fan underneath. So they chopped the bottom out to fit a round fan. And they had changed the, um, the uh, transformers out from two transformers to a single transformer that had both the taps. And uh, it kind of sucks. Because that was, uh, visually, when you looked at the top, it was perfect, but then you turned it over, and it was all history. It's all history. Yeah. Yeah. Modded out. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was disappointing, to say the least. But that was a really that was nice... Really intense, then. And it was a hobbyist. Yeah, it was a hobbyist thing. That's why, I, that's why, it's just like, you know, it's like baseball cards or comic books, right? Why does it make the mountain cars worth so much money? Because everyone shoved them in their spokes of their bicycles and destroyed them all. Do you know the whole in an artifact? <laughs> well, I saw that there, and I, and I, I knew you wouldn't have. No, I reused all of them. I reused I re something there. Every and I was going to ask what was there that yeah. you replaced with that board. Yeah, I redo, I, I reuse all of them everywhere. It's, it's intentional. Screws. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if I replace a screw, if I have to replace a screw, obviously I keep the old ones and I try and match them all. I find that I use stainless steel screws because they're the only ones that look the same as the originals. Um, you know, even if I use, look at the wire I use, right? I tried to match, I got new old stock wire just for the, um, for the one thing I, just to add the, uh, the line. And look, I even had to get that made. You know. Oh, also, uh, that's, those, uh, that power supply, that's like uh, handmade. What do you mean handmade? The power supply is, it was made by, these are just two transformers and that's what the bike shop did. Most of the mods to this actual case, so the, the case itself people make a lot of mods to, uh, that's why there are really very few left. And there are very few that aren't chopped to bits. So of the other ones I know of, except for the one that I've seen online that, you know, I've never seen it for real. Every other case I know has mods like they cut out under here to put a fan and they made giant cuts. Or they replace the transformers with a single transformer with multi tabs stuff like that. But once again, did not no holes were created in, in the making of those. <coughs> because I wouldn't use screws, I just wouldn't use tape. But it's supposed to tape them to come out. Yeah, so it's something that would come off. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's all the parts were originally in the chip for one chip. That yeah, chip, 74123, and I wrote one off on the S100 card. You have them the exact date. And then I went, I think, I think you heard the story earlier, I went to go replace it, and I think all the ones I ordered online were bad. Yeah. And then I wound up, luckily I found a replacement, but not for this, I put it on the other card. Well, the S100 card, who cares? Yeah, I, that was my old one, the S100 card. Well, for example, I have uh, the Tech Beat Group 2 that had a bad chip in it. I replaced it with the other card. It's a big piece of terminal. Like a stock and new cares, yeah. So the other interesting thing is um, they switched from 6820s from AMI to Cinertech 6520 when they went to the next run. And so check this out. See the rubber underneath? Because they didn't support the board right. They needed another support. So the board would warp from the heat because what happened is you have the weight of the card and then you have this guy heating up and there's enough there's enough silver over here that it just it comes down. And remember it's still silver. This guy, you know, well this one I don't know, I've never seen one of these go, but it's a lot it's a lot more rigid. Like this can't go. This is like you can't do this, right? This sucker was actually touching almost. So because it bent down. Modern, the modern, more rigid kind of yeah, so that guy, so I had to do that for safety reasons, so I put one in, let it run for a while, a couple of times, put another one in, I'm done, it's flat. You don't want to crack anything. I don't want to crack anything. Right, so, and typically these you don't crack traces, so it's not like, it's not like, you know, a modern board you crack a trace off, one of these boards you wouldn't crack a trace. The only time I've ever seen a trace lift on any, any of these kind of boards, on an NTI, not on this kind of thing, but on an NTI S100 board, is like, when you're desoldering, if the if the thing you're desoldering gets stuck, it'll it'll peel the trace. Right. The other interesting thing that makes this board unique is none of the pads are missing, so no one ever did any custom work here. So it's interesting that this person customized the case. He put a power switch on, so he actually used it. Right, which he should have had. <coughs> he used it, but he never he was he was a software guy, I guess, not a hardware guy. 
Because the one thing that this case did have is it did have a switch to flip the bank, bank memory between uh, four, between 8K contiguous and 4K and 4K for basic. Because basic had to be now contiguous. It's just the way it was. Now, this could use a 6800 as well. Yeah, they designed it for the 6800 or 6501. That's what all the extra clock circuits are. Okay, so if you were if that was used, you have to fill in those parts. You have to fill in those, and then you have to change some jumpers. Have you ever seen one? Never. Apple did one. Some guy in Australia made a sixty, made made one, made a replica. He did a Mimeo uh, running at sixty-eight thousand, and then someone else put a 60, 6501 in um, for a very short period of time just to show that it would work and then took it out because that's a museum of 6501. Yeah. Everyone's just amazed the caps are Caps, the ESR and the caps are amazing. Those ones are tending to be reliable. I mean, I've had to replace a few ones. They're mills back, but they're reliable if you take care of them. Yeah. If you shock them, they will go. Yeah.